Hello ladies and gentlemen, Big Daddy Top Hat here, bringing to you the second video covering the history of the Mortal Kombat franchise. In my last instalment covering this fine subject, we looked at the birth of the series and how it caused outrage. This would lead to hearings on video game violence and the corruption of society, headed by Joe Lieberman and Herb Cole. The outcome of these events would result in the video game rating system being introduced across the United States. So with these new measures in place, the harassment that the Mortal Kombat brand would receive would begin to cease, right? Well, absolutely not, and what we discussed last time was only just the beginning of the public outcry against this franchise. While in the USA the series would continue with the new rating system in place, Germany, on the other hand, would take the extremist measure of banning the game altogether in their country. So today we are going to take a deep dive look at this game and analyse how it built on its predecessor, but equally as importantly, we need to look into how this game was deemed so heavily offensive that a western country would choose to restrict players from even touching it. Why was this freedom of expression removed in Germany, with regards to what was basically a rudimentary 2D video game? Let us discuss all of this further today. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the mad story of Mortal Kombat 2, a game that was banned in Germany. Yeah! The wave of controversy helped create the huge success of the first Mortal Kombat in 1992 and managed to produce a brand that could go toe to toe with Street Fighter 2 in terms of marketing appeal. Just one year later in 1993, Midway were ready to release the next Mortal Kombat game in arcades, but what could the team do to create a game that was a step up from its predecessor over such a short time period? Let's explore. The project lead programmer known as Ed Boon set out to create a game with the intention of making something that both looked different to the first game, yet included all of the features that were intended for the original, which they never found time to implement. Basically, the goal was to make things bigger and better. More characters, more moves, more blood. In regards to this plan, according to Boon, the biggest challenge was probably the amount of content we had to generate. Everything in Mortal Kombat 1 we wanted to double. All of the fans of the first game had high expectations for the second one, and now all eyes were on us where before we kind of snuck up on everybody. During development, Boone would ensure that care was taken with the programming process in order to give the game the best feel possible. John Tobias, the game's lead designer and artist too, would note ways that the game built on what was available before, commenting that the previous game held too much of a reliance on juggling opponents in the air, with successive hits. This feature was apparently accidental, so was tightened and improved upon for the sequel. Speaking of juggling, Boone adds the reason as to why they decided to tighten it, as opposed to removing juggling altogether. This was to help set the franchise further apart from the competing titles, such as Street Fighter and allowing the players to devise their own combinations of attacks. There were at times additions they would also experiment with and later cancel, such as a bonus stage that featured a bunch of ninjas jumping all over the place and you would swing at them just like you're in the middle of a fight in a kung fu movie. But like with all games, some elements never progressed past the cutting room floor. Boone also notes how exciting it was to work on this sequel, because all of the Mortal Kombat mania. He states the hysteria of the home versions of Mortal Kombat 1 was literally all around us. A game that went on to sell 3 million copies. The feel-good adrenaline of this success fueled them to be able to work every second, which helped them create a much bigger game than the first time around. Boone mentions that the game they created was slightly darker than its predecessor, although a more vibrant colour palette was employed and the new game had a much richer colour depth than the previous two. The game even featured the new use of multiple layers of parallax scrolling in the arcade version, making this Mortal Kombat more visually striking than ever before, and there was even a touch of comic relief added to the game as well, which we shall soon get to. Speaking of development, Dan Forden would also return as the game's sound designer and composer using the Williams DCS sound system, but all the features I have just mentioned are just scratching the surface, as you will soon see as we progress through this video. In terms of this title's gameplay, as one would expect really, it builds on what was available before, adding new mechanics here and there to refine the experience. 
For starters, players could now perform crouching punches along with low and high kicks, having greater differentiation. Recovery times would also be reduced, improving the game's pacing and making it easier to perform combos. On top of this, all returning characters from the last game gained new special moves to differentiate the two games further, and the game played twice as fast, which I infer was a change that was probably implemented in part due to the success of Street Fighter 2 Turbo Hyperfighting. One of the brand's unique selling points, the Fatality System, was also expanded upon, introducing a range of exciting new special moves of this variety, or even stage-specific fatalities that took advantage of the stage surroundings. But the most notable difference in this area is the inclusion of the non-lethal finishing moves, babalities and friendships, which bring much needed comic relief to this gritty experience, allowing players to turn their opponents into crying babies, or completely non-malicious interactions such as dancing or giving gifts to defeated opponents. I always loved this ridiculous feature as a kid. The game would expand on the Mortal Kombat roster, increasing the character lineup on the player select screen from 7 to 12 characters, and the game's plot would be a continuation from the first game too. Following Shang Tsung's defeat in the first game's Mortal Kombat tournament, he begs his master Shao Kahn, the supreme ruler of the Outworld, to spare him his life. Tsung suggests to Khan that they should hold the next tournament in the Outworld, and that the Earthrealm's warriors would have to venture there to attend. Khan agrees to this and even restores Shang Tsung's youth and martial arts prowess. Khan sends an invitation to Raiden, who gathers for Earthrealm's warriors to enter the tournament. This new tournament is more dangerous, especially considering Shao Khan has the home field advantage. But victory for an Earthrealm combatant is necessary to stop Khan subduing their world. Speaking of the game's story, an official comic book was released in conjunction with the arcade game that would describe the whole backstory in more detail. This comic was written and illustrated by Tobias himself, which was made available via mail order. In regards to both this title's gameplay and story, I guess it is worth touching on all of the new characters this game included, as each of these help give Mortal Kombat 2 a distinct identity from the original game. Firstly, we have Baraka, a mutant warlord of the Outworld's nomad race, known for his unpredictable behaviour and possession of a frequent violent streak. In fact, Baraka is just one of a number of new playable characters who do not represent the Earth realm. Speaking of Outworld fighters, we have Katana, a lady combatant who was a great addition. Katana is a female ninja who is a personal assassin who works for Shao Kahn himself. However, in the game, she is suspected of secretly aiding Earthrealm's warriors. Of course, equally as memorably, the game also features Katana's twin sister, Melina. Her mission during the tournament is to ensure the loyalty of her sister, but she also has plans for her own. Over time, Melina grew to harbour a great bitterness and jealousy towards Katana, whom Khan always favoured over her. Also new to the lineup, we have Jax, a US Special Forces officer who enters the tournament to rescue his partner Sonya Blade, who went missing in the Outworld while attempting to apprehend Kano. There is a then Kung Leo, a Shaolin monk and close friend of Liu Kang, and a descendant of the Great Kung Leo who was defeated by Goro and Shang Tsung 500 years before the events of the first Mortal Kombat game. He seeks to avenge his ancestor and the destruction of the Shaolin Temple. On the player select screen, Shang Tsung is also selectable for the first time. As mentioned earlier, this evil sorcerer has had his youth restored by Khan, making him more dangerous than ever before, but he retains his ability to morph into any of the playable characters just like in the first game. Apart from most of the characters returning from the previous title, we have two new boss fighters to contend with as well. We have Kentaro, Shao Kahn's bodyguard, sent by his race to avenge Goro's defeat in the first Mortal Kombat. Kentaro functions as the game's penultimate challenge. Then finally, players take on Shao Kahn himself, the evil Emperor of Outworld, who wishes to conquer Earthrealm by any means. He is the host of the tournament and the game's final boss. In regards to Khan, according to Tobias, he was actually based on one of my favourite villains of all time, Emperor Palpatine, in that he was a mysterious force who did not show up in the first Star Wars film and would not surface in any capacity until The Empire Strikes Back. Tobias wanted to give Mortal Kombat fans the same feeling he had when he first saw the Emperor in the Star Wars sequel. While the game failed to include Sonya, or Kano this time around, fortunately the game at least included three additional hidden opponents to unlock. 
Amongst of these we have Jade, a female ninja clad in green. Although not featured in the game's story, she appears at the start of random fights to drop cryptic clues on how to access her. We then have Noob Cybot, a dark silhouetted ninja who is a lost warrior from the first Mortal Kombat game. His name is just Boone and Tobias spelled backwards, and hilariously, due to his design being focused around an all black exterior, staff found it difficult when making him for the original game, without him appearing to look into bondage. In Mortal Kombat 2, he is a solid black palette swap of Sub-Zero, who fights with increased speed and Scorpion's spear. And finally we have Smoke, a grey ninja palette swap of Scorpion, who would make random on-screen appearances during gameplay. This fresh roster was amongst the many things that made Mortal Kombat 2 great, and the secret characters amongst the fighting lineup would further add to the game's intrigue, and make experiencing this game even more exciting. Speaking of this game's amazing characters, the production of this game was majorly stepped up to better represent the action in the game. Instead of shooting actors this time around on a high 8 camera like before, this time a $20,000 broadcast quality Sony camera was used to create the characters and animations for the game. I guess with the success of the first game, the budget was a lot higher this time around. Throughout this stage of development, the process would also be changed. At first, video capture footage would be processed into a computer and the grey backgrounds were removed from selected frames to create sprites. Later on though, the team would start using an alternative technique, this time using a blue screen and processing the footage directly into the computer, which was much simpler. It is also of note that throughout the motion capture part of production that the actors would be regularly lightly sprayed with water to give them a sweaty, glistening appearance. Ooh. Further to this, extra work was put into the sprites in post-production, adding extra muscle tone to the characters, which Tobias felt was an element that further separated Mortal Kombat from other games that took advantage of motion capture techniques. Kintaro's animation, like Goro before him, was created using stop-motion techniques with a clay sculpture. Kintaro was created by Tobias' friend Kurt Chiarelli. Also, a number of characters, just like with the first Mortal Kombat game, were created using palette swap techniques on existing characters. Sonya Blade and Kano were cut from the game reportedly due to a combination of memory limitations and Boone citing them to be the least popular characters in the game. Both characters did though make cameo appearances chained up in the background in Khan's arena stage. In terms of Sonya's absence as a playable fighter, Tobias and Boone felt Kitana and Melina could do a better job marketing wise than Sonya competing against the likes of Chun-Li. In fact, a further female fighter was set to be included at one point in development too, based on the real-life kickboxer Kathy Long, however was cut due to time constraints. In fact, a male bonus character also suffered the same fate, who is known as Q Huang. In terms of characters that show up, one of the game's most famous moments is the man who appears in the lower right corner, who shouts, TWISTY! any time an uppercut is landed. This is Dan Fordham, the game's sound designer we mentioned earlier. Toasty has become one of the best known and most celebrated video game easter eggs of all time, and this moment has been parodied in popular culture a number of times since. When the game finally hit arcades, like with many arcade fighters, the game would be revised over time to further refine the game. Version 1.1, which was somewhat of a beta version of the title, contained almost all the moves, but not many fatalities have been added, and Shang Tsung's fight was very buggy. There were also other issues, such as Kintaro could be beaten simply by punching the whole entire match. Revision 1.4 would fix some of these problems and include new moves, including the first part of the Freeze Uppercut Fatality during a match. Revision 2.1 would be the first official release featuring more refinement than ever, although there are a couple of issues that could result in the game crashing. For example, when Shang Sun uses his soul stealing fatality against certain characters, or ridiculously, when you could attack the baby after performing a babality, which I do not even feel comfortable going into any more depth on. All the issues would be ironed out though by Revision 3.1, which would also include more blood. Yeah. The game would soon be ported to nine different platforms, thus meaning the game would be spread across home consoles, handhelds and home computers. Now we could spend a great deal of time comparing and contrasting these conversions, however I feel that could get a tad tedious. However, one key event I would like to note is that the Super Nintendo version of the previous Mortal Kombat game was outsold by the Mega Drive version by 3 to 1. This appears to partially be down to fans rejecting the Nintendo port of the game due to blood being taken out and replaced with sweat, essentially removing one of the key elements that Mortal Kombat was about in the first place. 
With Mortal Kombat 2 for the Super Nintendo, they would see the errors of their ways, allowing both blood and fatalities for the game this time around, however only in the West. The Japanese version however is censored to a degree, with green blood for all fighters, as well as the screen colours turning black and white for all character specific lethal fatalities. The initial critical reception of Mortal Kombat 2 was overwhelmingly positive, with Sega Visions describing the way in which the sequel was directed as sheer brilliance, and Nintendo Power calling it the hottest fighter ever. Tony Brusco of the Daily Gazette called the incredible hype surrounding the game well deserved, describing it as a perfect blend of great graphics, action and violence. As expected, Mortal Kombat 2 was a huge commercial success. The game made $50 million in sales in just the game's opening week. Acclaim Entertainment said Mortal Kombat 2 was the largest introduction of a video game in history. Distribution of over 2.5 million copies around 15,000 stores required 65 trucks and 11 jumbo jets. Considering that Mortal Kombat 2 was an even more high profile release than the first game in the series, this would arguably result in even more outrage and controversy than what surfaced with the release cycle of the original game. The debate regarding violent video games would continue to rage on with Nancy and Cherry of Toledo Blade writing that both games had an army of critics and people upset by the bone crunching, blood spurting, limb ripping violence depicted on the small screen. In fact, issues were raised with a second game that had never even been brought up before with the first one, due to more critical people becoming aware of the game. This would include a gentleman known as Guy Aoki, the president of the Media Action Network for Asian Americans, who would call Mortal Kombat racist for perpetuating Asian stereotypes and feeding into the belief that Asian people are martial arts experts. This would result in publicists directly from acclaim responding to the allegation, stating, This is a fantasy game with all different characters. The game was not created to foster stereotypes. In fact, it was not just racism that Mortal Kombat 2 would be accused of, as a university critical studies professor known as Marsha Kinder would declare Mortal Kombat 2 to be sexist and misogynistic. The allegation was made due to Kinder believing that the most violent possibilities the game presents players with are against women and that the female character's fatality moves are highly eroticised. So taking both of these anecdotes into account, it illustrates that people have always tried their best to look for sexist and racist elements in products they do not like. Modern so-called progressives are not doing anything new or innovative, like some people would try and have you believe. Cancel culture is nothing new whatsoever. Further to this, on a different note altogether, Mortal Kombat would get heat from the actors themselves who portrayed the characters in the game. Basically, it is claimed that if the Mortal Kombat games sold well, Daniel Pessina and the other actors who portrayed the fighters in the game would be remunerated again down the line, but apparently no specific figures were ever agreed upon so there was never any payouts. This would result in the actors seeking additional royalties for the game's home ports, so would therefore sue Midway, Williams, Nintendo of America, Sega of America and Acclaim Entertainment for misuse of their likenesses in an unauthorised way in two different cases in 1996 and 1997, losing on both occasions. Piscina, who was seeking to be paid $10 million for being digitised at an earlier date for the game, would later participate in the Bloodstorm advertisement photo shoot, attacking Mortal Kombat. In regards to all the controversy surrounding the release, Boone notes that I've always had the position that the rating system was a good idea, and should be in place. Once Mortal Kombat 2 came out, there was a rating system there. We were an M-rated game, and everybody knew the content that was in there, so it became almost a non-issue. Tobias agreed, saying that they were content with the M for Mature on our packaging. Despite everything panning out as they wanted in the United States despite the criticisms, in Germany, on the other hand, things would play out very differently. The Germans would ban the release of Mortal Kombat 2 in their country, after the Federal Department for Media Harmful to Young Persons deemed the game unfit for a German release. This meant that if a copy of the game was imported into the country, it could be confiscated by the police for violating the German penal code. 
The grounds it was banned on was for showing so-called excessive violence and cruel acts against representations of human beings, resulting in every version of the game being made illegal, with the exception of the Game Boy conversion, due to the graphics being in black and white and the system's limitations failing to replicate the same level of gore. The strong censorship laws in Germany preventing the release of Mortal Kombat go back to the fallout of World War II, where West German media was subject to censorship by the Allied occupational forces. This meant that German authors, publishers, distributors and sellers were all subject to prosecution for spreading poisonous material. So while we can laugh at Germany for their strong censorship laws, it was actually the British and Americans who introduced such laws not the Germans themselves. Content displaying communist affections or anti-democracy leanings were most heavily regulated. Interestingly, a representative of the Allied forces admitted that the order, in principle, was no different from the Nazi book burning, although unlike the burnings, the measure was seen as a temporary part of denazification. What was always seen as the main priority regarding these censorship laws was to protect German youths from said poisonous material, to prevent the German people from repeating the mistakes of the past. For many years going forward, government officials would work tirelessly to prevent individuals under the age of 18 from being exposed to immoral, dangerous or inappropriate content. So the banning of Mortal Kombat 2 in the region was basically red tape that was still in the way as a result of the fallout from the Second World War. Over the years censorship laws would eventually be relaxed somewhat, although freedom of speech is still restricted in Germany to a larger degree than many western nations, so the marks of history are still there. Speaking of freedom of speech and expression, even the greatest advocates for such a way of life only live by such codes when it suits them so silly censorship is not even unique to just Germany. Let's take the United States of America as an example. When the British Monty Python movie, known as The Life of Brian, was released, the film was banned outright in many US states, simply due to many people in power seeing the movie as poking fun at Christianity. Basically, the grounds the film would be banned on would be due to many states having strong obscenity laws in place. Speaking of which, obscenity is not protected under the First Amendment rights to free speech, thus meaning that violations of federal obscenity laws are criminal offences in the USA. While obscenity laws spit in the face of true free speech and encourage censorship, in most cases the laws are used for the greater good. However, there are still occasions they can be abused in the country, such as the banning of a harmless Monty Python comedy movie. To conclude, no matter where you live in the Western world, convoluted censorship laws are in place, and none of us have actual free speech to say whatever we like, even though I have noticed many people believe that they actually can. We are only allowed free speech and expression if what we are saying or producing is not deemed to be obscene. And America, the home of Mortal Kombat 2, has the same issues as everywhere else. All I can say is thank god the game never attempted to heavily mock Christianity, otherwise those states would not have got a new Mortal Kombat or Life of Brian movie. But thankfully the game only contains the sort of content that would see a ban in Germany. Yeah! So ladies and gentlemen I hope you enjoyed today's video learning about Mortal Kombat and I did not bore you too much about the freedom of speech, censorship and obscenity contradictions across the western world. All these laws around Western civilization are all in place for good reason, but that does not mean they do not get abused here and there. Anyway, I welcome your thoughts in the comment section and I will be keen to know if you would be interested in a video covering Mortal Kombat 3. As always, this video was partially funded by the wonderful people who back this channel on Patreon. Those who back my channel for $5 a month or more gain access to my exclusive content library, where I add a brand new video to it every week. There are now four videos to watch thus far, with the most recent covering the tragic story of Alan Turing, and the first ever computer game back in 1948. So if you want to further support what I do, you may want to back the channel and check those videos out. Speaking of patrons, shoutouts go out to Sebastian Velez, Carl Johnson, A Murder of Crows, Heo Paula Lopez, Joseph Rasmick, Corey Imar Sr., Capcom vs SNK, BXL Gotham, Rowan Dinch, Evan Balder, Philip Manth, Cambo Rambo 82, Azra Rawakai, 
Keith Ferguson, Dropkin Varela, Prince Knight, Michael Cullix, Ago, Jordan Durant, Age of Life 85, Alephia Swanson, Timothy W. Haskins II, Nick Daniels, Princess Zana, Glennie Galen, Daniel Daly, Computer Man, House of a Ted, Gary Pinkett, EC Professor, Kid Anime, Justin Wang. Aaron McNamara, Hermes Gonzalez, Instant Gratification Monkey, Man Shovel, James Bishop, JB, Post DXL, Michael Hall, Wesley Sanghi, Ben Dover, Langston Miller, Noob, Brian Barry, Stephen Lewis, Sarah Powell, Vlamic Renee, Marvin Araliga, Chris Cool, TOT Driver, Adrian Hannington, Bernard NG, Richard Stu Stewart, James McDonald, Crazy Yell, Dan Van Dammit, Adam Castin, Louis Viant, John Bates, David Bow, Chris Fisk, Paul Elliott, Me Machine Dean, Mike Bruno, Rick67, Antonio Rodriguez, Hans Christian, Craig Jenkins, Tom Elliott, Retroverse.com, KC Wright, Since Spaces, Zai, Gunther Hendricks, and everybody else who backs my channel. Yeah.